Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Sharon Bowers, and I am the Director of the Community Engagement and Service Learning in the Center for Educational Excellence. I'd like to welcome you to our first Texan talk this spring term. The CEE hosted two research talks last fall. If you missed either of those, they are both available on Tarleton's YouTube channel. And this talk will be available there as well after it's done. Before we begin, the CEE would like to thank our live stream team, David Betts, Joey McReynolds, and graduate assistant Reagan Rogers for all of their help in supporting us in these Texan and talks and uh, planning, promoting, and providing them for the university. It is my honor to introduce our panelists today. They are four of the 2019-2020 Outstanding Junior Faculty Award recipients. We have with us Dr. Jensen Branscombe from the College of Liberal and Fine Arts, Dr. Victoria Shreeby from the College of Science and Technology. And Victoria, if you'll unmute, thank you. Dr. Kelsey McIntyre from the College of Education. And Dr. Brandon Smith from the College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences. We also have with us Dr. Jim Gentry from the Center for Educational Excellence. Jim is serving as our Q&A moderator today. We're gonna to begin our talk with a few scripted questions and then we will move to audience, questions from the audience. So if you have a question, go ahead and put it in the Q&A and Jim will help us field um, those questions and pass them on at the end of our um, talk. If you have a question that's already been posted, you can use the upvote uh, function uh, to help us organize those. Jim, is there anything else you wanna share before we get started? No, I think you did a great job explaining that. Thank you. Okay, good deal. All right, so our first question for our panels, panelists, what strategies do you use to excel in the areas of teaching, research, and or service? Dr. McIntyre, do you wanna start? <laughs> Yeah, uh, certainly I can go ahead. Um, so strategies to excel in those three areas. Um, every, every semester, um, I set out a goal for myself for in each of those categories. And so it's something that I write down. So maybe it might be, I'm going to uh, get one article published or um, <clears throat> you continue working on a research project. And then also, within my teaching, it might be um, get better at answering emails or get better at um, keeping up with uh, grading um, dates. And then for, for my service, um, obviously those types of things require a lot more planning um, ahead, but I try to incorporate at least one service learning project within my courses. Um, and I write it down or I have it like up on my whiteboard so I can see it every day. That's been helpful for me. Thank you, Dr. McIntyre. Um, Dr. Branscombe, do you have anything to add to that? Sure, I'm happy to um, add to that. And, and again, I just wanna uh, say hello to everybody and, and thank you for having me. Um, I'm excited to hear what my colleagues have to say. Um, you know, when I, when I think back about what has helped me be successful um, at Tarleton, really the first thing that comes to my head is um, just how lucky I was to be hired into a department um, with really great colleagues. And so that's obviously not a strategy, um, and I know people don't necessarily have control over that. But I do think over the years, something that I, I have tried to be intentional about is to um, continue to foster a sense of, you know, collegiality and just um, support within my department among my colleagues. And I, I think there's a clear connection between um, who I work with and my success at Tarleton so far. Uh, we try to, you know, keep up with what one another is doing in terms of scholarship and even in terms of a teaching load each semester and their service commitments. And that way we all kind of look out for each other. And I think I've been able to um, have success and you know, teaching and scholarship and service, just because I know my colleagues are looking out for me. Um, and then I've tried to, to reciprocate. And if I have a colleague who I know is um, on a, a deadline for a research project one semester, or maybe has ended up with you know, too many committees or uh, extra students more than they normally have, 
um, we can work together to maybe not ask that person to be on a new committee in the spring. And so, um, again, I, I, I would encourage people in terms of a strategy uh, just to try to develop those kinds of relationships with people they work most closely with, because it's really uh, been beneficial to me. Great. So those collaborative collegial relationships really help you out. Yeah. Um, anyone else have anything to add, any strategies to add in any of the areas? Um, I would just add that one of my strategies has been to try to combine aspects of all three. Um, so scholarship, teaching, and service. Uh, Dr. McIntyre mentioned service learning projects. Those are really great for classrooms, um, especially since it gets them out and into some kind of applied experiential learning uh, experiences. And uh, I think in terms of that, I would definitely encourage new faculty to look into some of the training programs through the CEE. So I've been part of SOTL, um, the PCR community, um, the Engaged Scholars Academy, all of those are really great to learn how to kind of use our time wisely and take advantage of all of those things because you can do service learning in the class and then do research on it and publish that. So you can kind of stretch everything out and that's just been really a good way to combine all of my interests, but it's also really efficient in the way we use our time. All right, anything else to add to any of that? Anyone? Okay, I think that um, Victoria's answer kind of leads into our next question, actually, so great segue there. Um, in which area, uh, teaching, research, or service, do you feel the strongest? And how do you compensate for that in the other areas to kind of improve? And we can start with uh, Dr. Smith this time. All right, thank you. Um, well, by far, I would say that my strongest area has been research. Um, I was among some of the first research fellows when we started the research fellows program so through ORI. Uh, most of my recognitions in this position have been through research. Uh, I was able to start my research in that way because in developing my research philosophy, I really determined that in my role at Tarleton, I couldn't approach things the way I'd done when I was in graduate school at other type universities. Students were essentially the base of my program. I didn't come up with the ideas. I came up with the general parameters and then the students developed the ideas. I said, okay, here's your box. Now try your best to not fit in the box. Try your best to blow the sides out of the box and come up with the ideas. And so research was really driving my program. How did I compensate for it in other areas? I was fortunate being in the College of Agriculture on service. Uh, we have the FFA contest every year. So the service component was built in. As far as my service to the university, my service to the community, that was built into my job. In teaching, I will say I struggled. I struggled very heavily my first two, even into my third year um, with teaching. And it was something that my department head and I discussed every time I went up for annual review. I would tell him, look, I'm doing really well in research. I know I'm meeting expectations in teaching. I'm getting the classes done, but I'm not really knocking it out of the park. I'm not satisfied with what I'm doing. And so it's just been one of those I had to recognize it was a weakness and figure out how to compensate for it. Either this was going to be the way I was going to be or what can I do? And I, like Dr. Shrivey was saying, I ended up going through several of the different programs to enhance my teaching portfolio that have allowed me to improve on the teaching side. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Does anyone else have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, I, uh, I know it was previously mentioned, but I want to kind of uh, reiterate the um, combining all three. So teaching, research, and service. I, I really think that they're, they're complementary responsibilities. Um, and so I, I feel strongest in, in my teaching, um, but I, I try to have students complete, of course, service learning projects. And then collecting data on their experience, um, completing those projects. And so obviously I get um, some research out of that. And then I learn a little bit about, okay, what could I have done better? What can I do to improve for, for the next semester? 
Um, and so I've definitely noticed that uh, the data analysis <laughs> urges me to, to make some changes, which is really helpful. Okay, so combining um, your efforts in all three of those areas to improve each. That's wonderful. What were some of the challenges that you discovered as junior faculty? And what are some suggestions that you have for overcoming those challenges that, that maybe haven't been addressed so far? Dr. Branscombe, Branscombe do you want to uh, begin? Sure, um, yeah, thanks. I, I feel like as a junior faculty, we, we hear a good bit about the like work-life balance. And I think one of the challenges I was not expecting was have, having to figure out like the work-work balance, right? Sort of seeing how these different pieces of our jobs fit together. Um, and so really within each of my areas having to develop, um, you know, ways to sort of uh, find extra time to make sure I'm keeping my schedule quite balanced. And this is especially the case for me with research because I look at my calendar every week and my teaching and service are already populated there. Uh, but really within each, I mean, that that for me meant finding ways to um, uh, to be more efficient with, with my teaching and with service. And so, for example, with teaching, to build on some of what my colleagues have said, but Tarleton does have a lot of uh, resources to, um, you know, help us develop pedagogy and, and stay on top of the, the most recent um, findings on, on the scholarship of teaching. Um, and so for me, I've developed um, ways to get effective feedback from students so that if I see I'm wasting, not wasting, right, spending a lot of time uh, on an assignment and grading, and then I hear back from students that that's not super helpful to them in, in their learning, um, I can I can cut that out right and, and develop something something new um, with service. This can be a challenge, I think, especially for junior faculty. And so for me, it just came down to um, having to learn to say no to things, which is hard. Um, but but figuring out where I, I really felt like I had um, something to contribute right and 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 put in 100 percent in those areas, um, but maybe um, just having to, to say, I, I, this would stretch me too far and I wouldn't be effective. Um, and then the, the research, like I said, is the most challenging part just to set aside time. Uh, but for me within that, I found that I also had to set aside time um, to really kind of be still and think. <laughs> that was something that I was missing. So maybe also sort of scheduling in breaks as part of my uh, scholarship time, just to let those ideas percolate. So I, I know what it is I'm I'm doing uh, was very helpful, but basically finding that that work work balance, um, which was initially overwhelming for me. Yeah, and setting aside time, like you say, for a break or to reflect upon what have I been doing, what's been working, and and make adjustments. Very important. Anyone else have any challenges they'd like to address and strategies for overcoming those? Um, I would reiterate a lot of what Jensen just said. Um, that some of the uh, the main challenges um, are kind of aspects of time management because there's just so many moving pieces all the time. And um, a trick I learned from uh, Dr. Rebecca Putnam, who's in um, education, is that she there's a she has a board with like what's critical versus kind of what it's due and uh, to use post-it notes and move it around into these spaces to kind of organize, keep the moving pieces. So I have a board in my office um, with post-it notes about what's where in terms of research and um, paperwork that's going through for field trips and things like that, just to kind of keep track of everything. So um, visual things like that's helpful. I know other people use apps and things like that, uh, but I think all of that's good. And I would also second this idea of making sure to schedule time for yourself to just think or write or something like that. Some people are great at writing when they have a 15 minute time slot. Um, I'm not one of those people. <laughs> I need to give myself a, a solid few hours to really get into a paper, but to actually allow yourself to schedule that and then defend that time. Uh, Cause something I struggled with early on was like, oh yeah, sure. I can take that meeting or I can have that extra office hour in that time. And then it just always gets pushed 
back and back and back and then it's summer and you never really gave yourself that time. Um, so I think just aspects of, of scheduling and, and giving yourself the time you need to do what you want. Yeah, it's so important to identify that time and to protect it. Um, because uh, I think like Jensen said, it's your teach, some of your time is already allocated, right? Your teaching's already there, it's already on your schedule. So you have to kind of carve it out and to identify what is the best mechanism for you. Can you get something done in 15 minute breaks or do you need to block off a larger amount of time? Those are great suggestions. I love the post-it notes because it really tells you like sometimes things shift where what's critical this semester might um, shift down into another category next semester because there's all this flow. Yeah, anything else that you guys would like to share? Uh, I will say that my faculty mentor stressed to me over and over and over again when I first got here about work-life balance. And one thing that I discovered, I will not say she's wrong. She, she is correct, work-life balance is important. One thing I discovered was for a junior faculty member, it essentially does not exist. So, so what I what I determined and what I did was my life became my work and vice versa. I mean, my wife, when it came to doing research, my wife was in the lab as often or more than I was. If I couldn't make it out there to work with a student because I was tied up in a meeting, I might send her. So the, the students end up becoming, I mean, there's some of them we treat like our children. I mean, they, it's literally, they, they become family because it's great to try to schedule time for yourself. I've never been good at it. I, I've tried several ways to do it. I go by all the calendars and everything. I haven't been able to schedule time for myself. So I decided to give up on trying to do that and just decide we're going to be committed to this and we're just going to weave it together. Weave it all together. All right. I think that's a great segue into our next question too. Uh, what are your strategies for locating strong collaborators? <laughs> uh, one thing that I did is I actually relied on part of the network that I developed through graduate school. So I've reached out to a lot of people. We have good collaborators here at the university. Don't get me wrong. I, I like collaborating within the department, within the university, but I ended up getting outside more than I did inside. Um, my main collaborator has been at the AgriLife Center here in town. Dr. Jim Muir, anything that he does, we complement each other's work. So we end up working together on pretty much everything we do. I've reached out to old mentors at universities that I attended and said, okay, we were doing this back then. I've got this idea. I mean, one of my graduate students now is actually picking up a piece of my work for my PhD that we couldn't get done at the time. We didn't have time. And now she's doing it here as a Tarleton project. So I've relied on a professional network through professional societies and through other universities as much or more so than I did relying on within Tarleton resources. All right, great, great suggestion there. Anyone else want to add, um, speak about how you facilitate collaboration? Um, yeah, I'd be glad to. Uh, so I, I kind of would, oh, I kind of would second um, what Dr. Smith said uh, about um, kind of having a base outside um, that I established in my my doc program. Um, but also through those individuals, I've been able to meet people that um, I necessarily I haven't necessarily had as like advisors or uh, colleagues in my doc program. And so it's just kind of like um, progressed out and I'm working with people that I hadn't known before. I maybe I haven't even met before, but um, I've like emailed cold uh, and said, hey, I'm interested in this. You know a little bit about it. I have an idea. Um, and so some of them might think I'm crazy and that's okay. Uh, but I think that the benefits that have come from just emailing people randomly and saying, hey, I admire your work and I wanna be involved um, has been, I mean, it's been really great. Excellent. And hey, even if it doesn't work out, who doesn't like getting an email that says, I admire your work, right? And maybe it sets something up for later um, on. All right, um, how, what advice would you give junior faculty to have a successful uh, first you know, two to three years here at Tarleton? Victoria, you wanna start? Um, sure, so uh, my first year, I was told um, to focus on developing my courses. 
because also when I came in, I had a lot of new courses to develop. So that's where most of my time was spent. Um, so I didn't really work on developing my research program until the second year, which actually I appreciated because I'm not from Texas. So I'm um, just getting a sense of what was available down here and who was around to potentially collaborate with um, was helpful because I had to kind of build up that, that capacity. Um, and I also wasn't added to too many committees. Uh, so I was kind of, my first year was all teaching oriented and then I kind of built up um, the other aspects in the later years once the foundations of the teaching was built, but um, I know that might be a different experience in different departments. Thank you, Victoria. Anyone else have um, some advice for successful first two or three years? Um, I think that what I would suggest is uh, I think I was I was really fortunate in that I had a, a mentor. Uh, Dr. Bowers kind of served as um, not kind of she served as my mentor um, coming in, and it was such a a valuable uh, relationship. So I would suggest finding out or, or seeking individuals that you can ask questions because we all have questions. We're coming into a you know a new organizational culture. We have questions, um, and sometimes we might be afraid to ask. Um, and so finding somebody that you can ask all these questions to um, that can kind of guide you um, was super helpful and uh, really valuable. All right, excellent. I didn't even pay her to say that either. So thank you. <laughs> Anyone else have any uh, piece of advice for our new faculty out there? I'll, I'll just add, I think those are, really great <laughs> pieces of advice um, to identify that that go to person for questions and to maybe not feel like you have to focus on all parts of the job um, and do you know get everything done that first year but um, yeah I mean I, I would also maybe just add try to try to enjoy it I mean I, I think most of us who end up in academia this is a it took a long time to get here um, and I think sometimes the um, sense of feeling overwhelmed with what the reality of the job entails, um, maybe takes away from the fact that this is, it's a huge accomplishment. And so get to know students, maybe try to find something on campus or an organization to do that maybe is apart from that teaching research service, um, because it, it, it makes the job much more enjoyable and um, you feel much more part of the community if you have spent some time in it. Yes. So I would agree with the community involvement aspect. I would also say, and I'm going to kind of echo what Dr. Shrive said on her first year was all teaching. I will say that even though I came in as an 80-20, my first year was pretty much all research. I was in the classroom, but I was there. And so as a faculty member, you know, look at your appointment. Look at what you're appointed as. Are you 80-20? Are you 60-40? What, what's your assignment role? But then you've kind of got to make a personal choice. What do you want to be known for? What do you want to be known to excel in? Because yes, we do all three and we're expected to do all three, but very few, if any people are going to excel in all three. So pick the one that you want to be known for and devote your time to that. For me, it was research. I wanted to be known for my research. And I would say that my successful teaching had to come around until the end of year three, end of year four. So it's, it's a time thing, and essentially you've got to decide what is your priority going to be. All right, well, thank you so much, guys. Um, we're going to uh, open it up to Dr. Gentry now to see if we have any questions from the audience members. Yes, um, I have one question from a graduate student attending uh, our panel today. Uh, our graduate student asks, what advice do you have for a student who is interested in pursuing a career as a faculty member? Um, I would say definitely take advantage of as many training opportunities as you're given. There's all sorts of great um, opportunities presented to graduate students, especially from not only the university itself, but from professional societies. So become members of those because it's usually pretty cheap um, for students. 
uh, especially now, I, I guess one of the weird silver linings of uh, going virtual is that conferences are now virtual. And a lot of times for students, the price to attend is free or really reduced. Go there, meet people, start to build your network, take advantage of those training trainings because some of the things we do as faculty, they don't teach you in grad school. They're not going to teach you how to really write a grant or run a budget or those sorts of things. So if there's the ability to learn that, that's something that you can put on your CV for when you apply that makes you more competitive and show that you actually have tried to get grants, even if they're just small student grants, try to show that you have the capacity to write grants for external funding. Um, I would also say if you're a GA, keep tabs on the classes you teach. Um, develop a teaching philosophy, especially if you want to apply for an undergraduate institution like Tarleton, if that's kind of what you're aiming for, and keep your student evaluations so you can kind of show how you did in that capacity and um, show that you have the ability to teach because that is most of our job at an institution like this. Uh, I, I would say in graduate school, I know, especially in my discipline, we train you to do research. That, that's your training. You're, you're expected to do research. You're trained to do research. And because we're so focused on that, we spend all the time. I, I've never met a graduate student that lacked for ideas. That lacked for, they were always curious about something. They had ideas. You know, I was told as a graduate student, take your ideas, put them in a folder, use them when you're a faculty member. Um, the thing that was not pushed if you want to become a faculty member was the teaching. And I like the idea of the teaching philosophy. The one thing I will tell you is as you're going through your classes, step back and almost, you know, be a ghost of yourself, almost have one of those out-of-body experiences. Look at the classroom. Is that the way that you want it to be done? Would you do something differently? Don't use it to then correct the professor. You know, see if any of my graduates are watching, please don't do this again on Friday. But um, you know, take a look at it. Is that what you want to do? Rem the one thing that I have told my students, I always try to remember, and the one thing that I hope any of them that go into the profession remember is never forget what it was like to be the student. When you're giving an assignment, when you're lecturing to the class, don't forget what it was like to be a student. If you wouldn't have liked it as a student, they aren't going to like it either. Um, so I, if you don't mind, I just wanted to add one thing uh, that I, I thought about uh, my first year here um, in my first faculty position uh, as a, as a student, I never quite understood the role of or, and the expectations of a faculty member. I didn't, you know, as a student, you see them in the classroom and you don't realize that they have other responsibilities. And so if you're wanting to go into that role, try to understand um, as much as possible or um, seek out a faculty member that you can discuss this with. What are the expectations, um, the different types of universities, research universities, teaching universities? What do you want, uh, what are you seeking out, you know, um, and, and also service? Um, I never understood that. And so uh, it would be really valuable if I, if I had known prior to, uh, I could have understood the, the role a little better. I'll, I'll add briefly too, um, I, this has probably been the case for a long time, but I think we're in a time where higher education is going to be changing significantly over the next you know, decade. And so if this is where you want to, um, what you want to pursue is your career, uh, maybe in addition to talking to that professor like Dr. McIntyre mentioned, um, you know, try to start to read up. There's, there's um, sort of academic uh, focus publications like the Chronicle of Higher Education. There might be a discipline-oriented organization that sort of comments on what's going on in higher education. Um, because in addition to what Dr. McIntyre said about having a better understanding of what your job will be like, you might also have a clearer picture of what is coming down the line when you actually uh, do end up um, in that position. Excellent advice for our um, graduate students out there. Dr. Gentry, um, do you have any other questions from the uh, audience? Yes, we have one uh, kind of a comment, then a, uh, I'll share a question that uh, the audience is wanting to have answered. Uh, Dr. Kayla Peak, uh, wonderful colleague, um, we came in together. She asked a question, but she made a comment that I definitely agree with. I just want to share it. She said, 
this is a great text and talk with solid information. I wish I would have had this type of support many years ago when I started in the profession. And I just want to say right on, Kayla. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Um, uh, Miss uh, Sansi Heard, uh, uh, she has a question. Uh, she said, she asked, what was the highlight of your first or year or two as a faculty member? What was the highlight? I would say when my first graduate student graduated, um, because <laughs> like Dr. Smith said, they kind of become like family. So and it was just somebody who thought my class was interested and interesting and asked if they could do research with me. And um, I think that was kind of the first like pat on the back, like, oh good, like someone's off and they got a job and you know, it was, it was a success. And, uh, and actually now that I'm a few more years into it, I'm to the point where students I had as freshmen are now seniors and I'm seeing them graduate. So I've kind of known them the whole four years. And I think that's, um, I think that's a really nice, I mean, that's kind of, that's the goal of the job, you know, is to prepare them for, for the rest of the world and to see them actually succeed and, and go out into the world is, is really nice. That's a highlight. Um, oh, you can go ahead. Oh, sorry, <laughs> the competing unmuting. Um, I'll just say I had a similar experience where I, I uh, was in uh, somewhat of an unusual position when I started at Tarleton in that I, uh, it was a temporary uh, position. So by the time I got to the end of my first year, um, not only did I have colleagues sort of advocating on my behalf, but I, I had some students as well who um, really spoke up uh, on my behalf. And that will be a, a memory that I always will think fondly of. Um, so I, I think I have, I have two. I know that when I, I first came in, um, started up a new field experience for my students to go out and get teaching experience, um, which was incredibly, um, uh, it was it was surreal because, I mean, as a student, you don't see yourself doing that. Uh, so it was, it was odd, but it was also a really cool experience. And then uh, I think one of uh, the coolest was when a mentor of mine, I, I had uh, proposed a research project and they said it was a good idea. And I like was kind of taken aback because you don't expect your mentors, you know, you're used to them telling you that uh, your writing is not the best or your ideas won't work. And so uh, when they said that it would work and it was a great idea, uh, it was it was a good experience. I'll say mine was probably when we started the first research project, because up to that point, I mean, I've done plenty of them, but it was always on someone else's back. You know, it, if it went wrong, it didn't come back on me, it came back on them. So when my first student started their first project, I was just as nervous as could be. I think I ended up delaying it two or three weeks just because I was like, am I really ready to do this? I'm not sure I'm ready to take on this responsibility, but that was probably the most exciting part. I'll say this too, any new faculty member, I'm not even sure I remember my first year. It, there are so many things happening, I really don't know if I remember much about that year. Those are all some great memories, guys. Thank you for sharing that. Dr. Gentry, do we have any other questions? Yes, uh, we have one from uh, Amber Bozier and um, she asked this from the panel. Does the panel want to discuss strategies for keeping track of achievements for annual reviews, tenure, promotion, you know, discussions with department heads, so forth? I'm seeing some nods, so I think yes. Um, so obviously degree works, they want you to log everything in there. Um, I, I'm a little bit uncentralized, I guess, in some ways, because I use degree works, but there are a few things that are a little hard to categorize within the system of degree works, especially the stuff that sort of covers all the bases. So I also have, um, uh, I will, I have a portfolio account, which I sort of have to teach the students how to use it. And it's sort of like, resumes and Facebook had a baby if you've never used portfolio, but it's nice because you can add pictures, you can add links to your articles, um, things like that, and you can categorize it by project. So that's been real nice because I have different projects for my actual research projects. I have projects for my classes, and so I can kind of 
um, keep track of what they did then. And then I basically have these little like Facebook album kind of uh, centralized locations where I can keep tabs on like, oh, that's right. Like they went to that conference or um, we submitted an abstract to this place or whatever it, the case might be. Uh, and then I also have a binder in my office that I just stick stuff into. Um, so if I go to a training or a workshop or an event, I just kind of keep the thing that they give you to you at it and I put it in the binder so I can remember that I was there later. So. Um, I, I'm kind of like Dr. Shravi. I'm not that great at keeping things in digital measures. I usually do it about twice a year, um, about the time the department head makes a mention in the hallway of, hey, I'm about to go pull the packet from digital measures, make sure everything's up to date. Uh, I'm still kind of old school. So I had to create a CV, a curriculum vita from scratch when I was an early grad student, when I was applying to grad school. What I've done is I have, I showed one of my grad students the other day, I have a folder on a thumb drive that's nothing but CVs. And so I just change the date at the end. And when something happens, I go in and I tack it on. And I just go in and tack it on, go in and tack it on. And then, you know, if something doesn't have an unrestricted CV, I've got it right there. If I need to restrict I can go in and pull things out, but it's it's the way that I catalog things. And then, so when it comes time to update digital measures and I've got half a year worth the stuff that needs to go in, I just go through the CV and say, okay, this was the last thing that was in this category. This was the last thing in this category. And I kind of like the way I organize my things better than the way the computer system organizes them. Um, I, I'm gonna I have some strategies and it's they've come from doing it wrong. <laughs> so um, my first year, uh, it was really overwhelming because I got at the end of the year and I thought, oh, now I have to put all this stuff in. And so I think that whatever would work for you, whether it's putting it on a CV or maybe like uh, writing it on a sticky note and sticking it in your drawer, whatever it is, I think that the main thing is to have a schedule. Maybe it's once a month that you go in and update it. Because when you get at the end of the semester, the end of the year, it's overwhelming. Um, and I know that if something's overwhelming for me, I just put it off and that makes the situation worse. So have a schedule for yourself would probably be my suggestion. I have one more uh, tip, which is to create a, an inbox folder. Um, I think mine's called I can't remember what it's called. I think it's for tenure or something. But just anytime uh, you get like a nice feedback from a colleague or a student or whatever, just stick it in that folder. Um, because also, you know, if you have ever a really bad day, it's kind of nice to go back and be like, oh, look, I did that right. Like, like so anytime you get a little like pat on the back, good job kind of email, because you might forget about them later, like put them in that folder. So it's there when um, you go your, when you're building your packet and you want to provide that kind of feedback. Yeah, a little warm, fuzzy folder. I like it. All right, Dr. Gentry, any other uh, questions from the audience? Yes, we have one uh, from Misty Smith and she asked, any advice for new faculty in dealing with rejection in the peer review process with uh, publication submissions? Good question. I'll jump in on this one. It's going to sound very bad, so I apologize in advance, but honestly, just get enough of them to get jaded because uh, the first one or two of them hit me hard. I mean, really hard. I My mentors had to console me. I was, I was just, I was distraught. I was like, I'm not cut out for this. I need to start looking for another job. I think the one that pushed me over the edge was I got one that it was just a random idea I had, and it wasn't a publication. It was actually a grant. I had idea I had, we submitted the grant, I reached out to some grad school colleagues, we put the time in, we thought it was good, got the letter back and it essentially said that they weren't really sure that I had any training in my PhD and I could really benefit from just talking to someone that had a little more experience in this because I was not cut out to do this. And I think they hit me so hard and cut me so deep that the scab kind of boiled over and after that rejections were just, okay, it's just another one, let's go on to the next thing. And so throw spaghetti at the wall till something hits. <laughs> I, I think I would agree with that. Um, I've gotten some, and of course, the first few ones really 
I was down and upset. Uh, and then the, the more I, I continue with my career, I mean, you're going to get rejected. It, it happens. And so I think that I, there's always comments that upset you. Some people can take some stabs that are pretty awful. Uh, but it is, I look at it as, okay, I sent it to them. They gave me comments. Now I can take their comments, even though they rejected me and use that to make it better. And also I've sent it to a journal. It got rejected and I sent it to a higher journal, like a bigger impact factor and got accepted. So don't listen to those, uh, those comments that are negative, uh, because sometimes they might not even know what they're talking about, or that's what I let myself believe. <laughs> Reviewer number two is famous for a reason, but yeah, I would say definitely that. And also um, the point, that's a good point of if it was, you know, just send it to a different journal uh, because it is, I mean, it's people reading other people's work. So um, it might not be a good fit in one place and a better fit in another place. And and that's fine. Uh, And grant rejections also something you'll get used to Uh, there. I would say celebrate like the, the small steps anyway. So if you um, if you submit a grant and it's rejected and then you submit a grant again, but it's rejected, but it was ranked higher, like, well, you made progress, right? If it's even ranked just a little bit higher. Uh, and then um, I would also suggest getting involved yourself as a reviewer. So like review a couple papers, maybe join a grant review panel, things like that, because you'll learn what it's like on the other side. And I think understanding the inner workings is like, oh, that's the way they want it formatted or that's what they're looking for. And then it will help you be more successful in the future. Great advice, guys. Um, Dr. Gentry, do we have any other questions? We are out of questions. So you guys did a great job answering all the questions. Absolutely. Um, panelists, do you guys have anything else that you'd like to share? We'll just kind of open it up to you. I don't think so. I'm not seeing anyone hit the unmute. So uh, thank you guys for joining us today. Thanks for uh, participating to our panelists. Uh, thanks to our audience members for for joining us and, and contributing questions. And um, our, our next text and talk, I'd like to invite you to that. It will be next uh, Tuesday, March 2nd. And this one will be our excellence in teaching uh, text and talk with Dr. David Frazier from the College of Agricultural um, and Environmental Sciences. And uh, he is the 2019-2020 uh, award recipient for um, the excellence in teaching award. So join us next week. Thank you.